to Brightline's virtual discussion, Mastering Strategic Transformation in Transformative Times. We have a rich program ahead of us, consisting of a short presentation by Edevandro Conforto, who is the head of strategy and research at Brightline Initiative. This presentation will bridge over to a panel discussion led by Ricardo Vargas, the executive director at Brightline In Initiative, with his panelist, Jeannie Bickford, the senior partner and managing director at Boston Consulting Group, and also Kit Krugman, who's the global executive director of Women in Innovation and head of organization and culture design at Co Collective. Before this pres presentation and discussion starts, we will tune into a short message delivered by president and CEO of Project Management Institute, Sunil Prashara. Hi there, Sunil Prashara here, the CEO of the Project Management Institute. And thank you all for joining today for this discussion on a very critical topic of strategic transformation during transformative times. And we're certainly living in very transformative times right now as all our organizations try to grapple with the effects of COVID-19 and the implications to our business. You hear the word transformation a lot, but what does it actually mean? And from my own perspective of having managed the transformation here at the Project Management Institute and also before in my career, I've learned a simple truth, and that is transformation is hard. And the reason why it's hard, because it isn't about minor adjustments, it's about big fundamental shifts that pervade the entire organization. And a failed transformation can come at an enormous cost. PMI's own research has found that the cost of failed transformations can be in the trillions. In fact, $2 trillion a year is wasted on failed transformations. And we have to think of ways to reverse that trend. So today, you'll have the opportunity to explore some of the biggest questions confronting leaders today. How can you succeed to drive lasting change in times like these? How can leaders successfully execute on transformation strategies? How can organizations use new ways of working and new technology advances like artificial intelligence and machine learning? And finally, what can we learn from organizations that actually get it right? So today you're gonna to hear insights from our Brightline team and, and some of their latest research and findings. Some of the key takeaways that they're gonna share, why some industries are pulling ahead and others are failing behind when it comes to transformation. Fast transforming organizations are nearly twice as likely to focus on developing their internal talent. And even the most advanced technology organizations must have the right environment and culture to allow you to do a transformation. You'll hear more insights from thought leaders like Jean Bickford, who's the senior manager and managing director at the Boston Consulting Group, and also Kit Krugman, who's the president and board chair at Women in Innovation. It's a perfect time for us to come together for this discussion. The whole world is changing very, very fast because of COVID-19. And the trends that we're going to talk about have been super accelerated as a result. As a recent article in Forbes put it, we once saw the future of work unfolding over years. Now, everything we predicted about the future of work will unfold in months. We see it in society today as governments and organizations grapple with big challenges like, for example, climate change or, or rapid urbanization. And of course, like having to manage pandemics. This is all resulting in an explosion in the number of projects that are going on around the world. We call this trend the project economy, a global mindset in which work increasingly centers around executing projects, both large and small. And of course, any transformation project and change effort requires leaders to have the right skill sets and the know-how and master the details of getting work done. So let's use today as an opportunity to learn some new ideas and new perspectives, things that we can take back home with us to our work environment and apply. Thanks very much. So, okay, thank you, Sunil, for the message. So I'm gonna kick off now the presentation uh, of the research. Um, we're gonna share um, a few research background and main findings, and then we're gonna have a panel discussions with our guests 
experts from the industry. And uh, Ricardo Vargas is going to lead this panel. And also, he's going to talk about what's the, what are the next steps in transformation. I want to start this presentation uh, uh, with the main goal. So today, we're going to provide an overview of the takeaways from this research that we completed uh, recently and we publish in our website. Uh, I really encourage every one of you to download the full report and also to take a look on the appendix with all the data that we collected. Here in this presentation, we're going to quickly overview some of the topics to fulfill our discussions with our experts and also take questions from the participants. Um, we started this research uh, uh, mid last year uh, with two main concepts in, in, in our, uh, as part of our fundamental work. One is what are the strategic initiatives? So we were understanding and uh, uh, defining strategic initiatives, those ones that are helping organizations realize their vision uh, and bridge the gap between what is the strategy, what's on paper, and the benefits and the deliver on the other side of this metaphor that we call the bridge. We also try to understand what is transformation. And for Brightline PMI, transformation refers to a more fundamental change, uh, a quantum leap, a cultural and operational shift that diverts the entire organization. So we are not talking only about digital transformation, meaning organizations are implementing a certain type of technology, but also changing the culture, changing in a ways of working. In today's panel, we're going to talk about a different perspective on transformation. And we started this research by uh, interviewing uh, 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 15 senior, uh, senior uh, executives, and Keith Grubman is one of them, so we are very happy to have her here. Um, and then we, we, we uh, perform a survey, a global survey, and you, with uh, over a thousand executives around the globe, and you can see here the percentage of this sample that co covers pretty much uh, different uh, continents in the globe. Um, today, I want to talk about four main key takeaways for this research. And the first one is we found in this research that what are the high performers? What are the organizations that are performing well in a strategic initiatives. And those organizations, we found that also they are performing really well in transformation, meaning if the organization wants to succeed in strategy implementation, and in this case, the high performing group is the group that achieves over 80% of the strategic initiatives, uh, those organizations are also extremely efficient and fast in transforming their business meaning that for every strategy implementation, for every strategic initiative, there is no way today we don't see any transformative initiative that is required to implement those uh, strategies or those goals. Especially today within the, uh, the crisis, the global crisis we are, we are facing, many organizations are, in, uh, are, are had to change the strategy in a matter of weeks and for those strategies, those goals to be implemented successfully, there is going to be a massive need for transformation. Either the way they work or working remotely, working in, in, in uh, distributed teams, or even change the whole business model because now there is a lot of uh, uh, risks about continuing the way or with the current strategy. So the next finding that is really key for our research is that High performance, so they are transformed faster and they're using agile ways of working. So we found that this speed is, is there is a relationship between adaptability and strategy implementation. So, of course, this is not a, a, a new breakthrough in terms of research, but there is a strong correlation in being adaptable in order to have the strategy implementation right. Organizations also, those ones that have um, a lot of capability to adapt and also the speed to transform, they use consistent process and formalized process to implement the strategy and also to transform. And over 9%, 9% of the adaptive organizations have some ways of formalized process. We also found what are the top frameworks when you ask these executives, what are the frameworks these organizations are using? 
So most of them are using any type of agile project management frameworks or any type of agile uh, uh, ways of working. They also using a lot of uh, techniques and process to define key objectives and how to uh, align and attach those key objectives with results, plus other more common uh, frameworks that we know uh, for many decades, like balance scorecards, also design thinking is being used for both transformation and strategic initiatives, business canvas, et cetera. We also found for those organizations that are really adaptable, they manage to adapt their strategy and transformation initiatives concurrently. These are the key uh, practices these organizations are adopting, starting from reviewing lessons learned with, from past failures, speaking and working closely with customers and, and users, re-evaluating constantly milestones and timelines, analyzing talent and resource, and we're gonna talk about a lot uh, about talent and leadership, and simplifying and modifying delivery process as much as possible. Also, creating ways and adapting ways to deliver their strategy as the strategy needs to change. I also wanna talk about what are the speed of transformation across different industry sectors. And this chart is very interesting. And I would tell you that doing this, do, we finished this, uh, this research before the crisis. I would, I would tell you now that in terms of speed of transformation for the industry sectors now, probably this chart now is totally different. So you can see, uh, automotive, technology, manufacturing companies, even consumer companies that are driven by the transformation rate. So they need to transform quickly because they are getting disrupted, technology are changing, etc. But in the other, in the other spectrum of the chart, you can see government, education, insurance, health, medical services. That today, actually, these are the industry sectors and the organizations that had to transform in a matter of weeks to deal with this crisis that we are facing now. So the next uh, key takeaway, the third key takeaway is the power to the people. So we need, as an organization, as a leaders, nurture and develop internal talent to, to change or to charge a strategic initiative transformation. Those ones that are related to strategic transformation, they need to be changed and transformed as well. And we recently published uh, what we call the Bright Line Transformation Compass. And it's really important that you adopt a strategy or a transformation initiative that is people-driven, is human-driven. So you need to inspire your employees, you need to work with your employees in the transformation initiative to help them create what is the personal vision for everyone in the transformation to be part of that transformation. Also, they need to understand what is the, uh, their takes and their uh, contributions and their, the benefits for themselves in the transformation. And also, and most importantly, organizations and leaders need to give tools and, and make sure that the, organ, the personal uh, uh, is transformed as well. As a, so they need to have a transformation plan for themselves. And this is extremely critical because sometimes during the transformation initiative, a lot of our, uh, people get lost because or either they don't understand why the organization is transforming or maybe they don't have enough uh, information to prepare themselves to be part of the transformation. So we need to be really careful about the transformation initiative because actually the transformation can become a nightmare if you are not able to engage and to help everyone in that process to be transformed along with the organization. The fourth a key uh, uh, takeaway is we need a strong and visionary leadership to help the transformation in your organization. And here are 10 key factors that will help the organizations to transform. And the first one is leadership. Then you also have the use of new technology, especially because many of the, the transformations, they will deal with a massive amount of data, cultural change as well, uh, transforming the business model. So you need to adopt the emerging technology to help your transformation initiatives. Then organizational culture, behavior, uh, thinking about the new product uh, process and operations, reviewing those processes. We need to rethink the team structure, how we work. And today, uh, it, you see a lot of people working from their homes and, and actually being productive and also experimenting new ways of working. Management approach and frameworks, decision-making process need to speed up. So we need to really have uh, efficiency, high levels of efficiency in the decision-making 
because otherwise you cannot make the changes necessary to, to, to implement the transformation, talent development and organizational structure. And on top of that, we found some of the really uh, important characteristics of the leadership, and we're gonna cover more of this in depth in our discussions with the panelists, to help organizations become faster in transformation. So for example, having clear vision and tangible goals, set a positive example, so the leaders must be uh, 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 the example for their employees and their teams. Uh, you need to be committed, so this needs, must be visible. Authenticity, so we need to be authentic in your communications and transparency in sharing information. So these are the key characteristics leaders need to develop to help the organizations, the organizations transform, especially now uh, where transformations that most organizations had to do in five years, most of them now need to do in a matter of weeks. So we also found a very interesting uh, aspect about the CTOs, about who is in charge of the uh, transformation initiatives. And despite we have a lot of people, a lot of different roles from CEOs, CEOs, chief operation officer, chief financial officers, chief technology officers leading the transformations, we found that if you have one person that is knowledgeable and experienced in the transformation role, for example, a chief transformation officer or a lead uh, or a transformation leader, these organizations will be a little bit more effective compared to those organizations that have other types of roles in the transformation. And some of the key highlights here is that having a chief transformation officer to act as, as a steward for transformation is very important. So we have a very clear defined role for the person that is committed and accountable to drive the transformation. The CTO may serve as a catalyst to formalize process, to define process for transformation, to ensure efficiency and handoffs among teams, etc. It's also important to create a CTO position in some organizations because that's a way to create an organization-wise accountability and visibility about the transformation initiatives. It also ensures that there is someone uh, put, uh, uh, that is concerned uh, 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 effort to making transformation initiatives a priority. So transformation has to be a priority because it's linked with the strategy implementation. So just to uh, sum up the key takeaways here from this uh, short presentation, to succeed with the strategic initiatives, organization must excel at transforming. So there is not, uh, not other way to really implement the strategic initiatives that organizations uh, are defining for themselves now without transforming uh, any aspects of the organization. High performance, those organizations that are implementing successfully the strategic initiatives, over 80% of the uh, initiatives are also faster uh, uh, in, in terms of transforming in using agile ways to implement their uh, process and goals. We need to leverage and empower the people that is responsible in working within the transformation. So nurturing and developing internal talent is also key for transformation. And finally, a strong and visionary leadership that will help determine the success uh, in strategic transformation for these organizations. So just a short presentation about the key takeaways. We have some other really cool insights and important insights. So I really encourage you, every one of you to download this uh, report free of charge from our website. And now I will invite Ricardo Vargas, the executive director, uh, of Brightline to take the lead on this panel discussions uh, and we'll kick start with some questions. Thank you. Hello everyone. Thanks Eddie uh, for, uh, for your presentation and also for helping us in leading uh, the, the work on this on this report. So it's, uh, it's as Sunil said, it's a, I would say a very challenging and very in some ways unexpected time uh, and we want to, to discuss a little bit on what is the impact of what is going on today in the transformation uh, and what key takeaways do, do, do we agree with some of the results? What is the perspective from uh, our two guests that will share uh, their experience uh, with us? The first one is Ginny from BCG. Uh, Ginny is a great friend of Brightline and one of the key supporters of Brightline since the beginning. So thank you very much for being with us and, and give us uh, your time to, to share some of your, your thoughts. 
and also I want to welcome Kit Krugman uh, from uh, Win Women in Innovation that will share also her perspectives and also thanks for being part of the interviews that we did on this on this uh, research. So uh, what I want is I want to kick off with Yuji uh, and base it on your experience at BCG working with executives. What would you say are the three key success factors uh, on the agile way of working on 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 this these companies? Yeah, so um, one of the things I just I did kind of wanted to share, which is an interesting observation, you know, in the study, we say that one of the top frameworks, right, for the high performance is agile ways of working. And well, what we've seen in a lot of our clients is that uh, with the COVID-19 crisis, it's actually forced agile ways of working. So I was just in a discussion with a CHRO, basically, where he was saying that um, they are actually making decisions faster and when I said, well, what are you doing different? You're hearing about daily stand-up, right? You're hearing about cross-functional teams that are getting together to work things through um, uh, in a, you know, all together in a, in a virtual room, right? Um, without really using the term agile. So I think maybe one of the first things for um, leaders to really understand is it is very much around, right, transformation and effective transformation is around more of the underlying principles of Agile, which is um, this concept of constantly, right, being in clear communication with one another, the kind of breaking down the silos and being able to figure out how to have teams at, that are cross-functional and have all the right skill sets in the room, whatever virtual or, or, or physical. So that's that's one of the first things is to recognize that it's more around a way of working and really getting uh, leaders to really embrace that. The, the second is that, you know, some, and we talk about this actually also in Brightline uh, more broadly, which is the fast failing, right? Uh, I think COVID-19 has also revealed to a lot of people that you don't know a lot of things and you don't know if you're going to get it right. Um, but in a lot of cases, right, um, particularly if you're not a frontline worker, right, so if you're talking about your company and you're trying to, to um, make some decisions on how you serve customers, how do you roll out products, and I think I work in the financial institutions practice um, at BCG, and a lot of the things that we saw in the United States was right, with the rollout of the CARES Act, uh, banks had to move very quickly to provide the Paycheck Protection Program, right, loans, you don't know, you're not going to get it perfect, but you got to have some sort of MVP, right? You have to get something out. And I think that the executives have actually realized that the world didn't end um, when things didn't go quite right. Um, but you had to actually be open that things didn't go right, but also open around what are the learnings. And I think that um, as Eddie was presenting on, on some of those top methods, right, it's iterative, right? That's point number two is it's iterative. It has to be iterative. And in transformation more broadly, so taken out of the context of COVID-19, in transformation in general, you, work, you walk in with certain assumptions of how you think the world will work. You think, you know, assumptions of how your customers will behave how the process will un unfold. But it doesn't always quite work out that way. And it's the ability to really in to iterate, I think, is the second thing. Um, the third thing is really just more around modeling behaviors, modeling, um, and, and I think, Eddie, you also referenced that, which is you just need to do these things and try them. Um, it takes, I, I would say, a lot of um, six, 30 days 60 days, whatever it is of new behaviors to start sticking as you practice them every day. And I think that for a lot of our leaders, it was this whole situation has been uncomfortable because their normal ways of working of taking two, three, four, six weeks to make a decision got thrown out the window. And what I think that they've learned is in that daily stand-up that making the decision um, wasn't actually that hard. And by the way, the consequences of perhaps getting some of those things not quite right wasn't actually that bad. And those are really the big, um, I would say, uh, things for someone to take away as a leader is, you know, 
you just need to think about what is the objective and agile ways of working, not about agile, capital A, to get confused by those, those things. Um, two is, again, the, the, the iterative nature of and learning and feedback loops that you need to be part of. And the third one is, is again, this point about learning the behaviors yourself and modeling them. Yeah, that, that's perfect. It's, it's not thinking about too much about Agile with capital A, but in find A's of working with agility on, on delivery. Uh, I, I want to, to, to ask you, Kitty, one question related to that. Um, all this turbulence on the transformation, and, and now even more, um, there is a very strong human component, right? Uh, the fears uh, and, and, you know, people afraid about losing their jobs, afraid about uh, not being competitive. So uh, you work uh, with a not-for-profit where the dynamic is a little bit uh, different. So can you share uh, uh, with us, I would say, some key factors uh, for you to get people also to transform themselves when mm. organizations are facing such a transformation like mm. today. Ricardo, I'm so glad that you brought up the human component of it because I think that that's one of the most important things in terms of transformation that is, that is often overlooked. So I think about anxiety and anxiety is actually one of the biggest creativity killers, right? It's the thing that holds us back from being able to think outside of the box, et cetera. And when you have this kind of shared systemic anxiety, then it automatically becomes much harder to think about how would I invent a new way of doing this? How would I change a way of doing this? Um, and so, you know, a good, a good metaphor, a simple metaphor I think about is when you're on a plane and you experience turbulence and the, there's nothing from the cockpit, there's no communication, all of a sudden the delta between what you are thinking and what you invent in your mind, for instance, within a minute, you've probably already written your obituary. You're like, oh, we're going down, it's over. Um, but when the pilot comes on to the loudspeaker and says, this is completely normal, here's what's happening, here's when it's gonna end, here's what we do know and what we don't know, then all of a sudden you're able to scale back the narrative that you've created for yourself and say, okay, I understand the context and return to what you were thinking about. And so the reason I use that metaphor is I think that going back to what Jeannie shared, um, the communication is so essential and rapid communication, whether it's what you know and what you don't know, um, that is what actually enables people to stay focused and not spin up the anxiety that is about the creation of narratives that might prevent them from actually inventing. Yeah. Uh, on, on the top of that, one, one key uh, interesting thing that Eddie just presented to us uh, was talking about visiona visionary leadership mm -hmm. and tangible goals. And sometimes they, they are not the same language because sometimes you say, oh, look, I want to put people living in Mars. But mm -hmm. then suddenly people say, how do I relate to, to that now? So, uh, 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 Jeannie, do you, do you have any advice, for example, for the leaders you support about how to turn this visionary future scenario into something that uh, your team members uh, and the people inside the organization can grasp and actively engage on? Yeah, I mean, I think that we always think about it, uh, we always break it down into three, three categories, right? One is, um, first, you do have to set the vision. Right. There isn't, there is a need to be, um, people need to have a purpose that they're working towards. Right. And so I'm, I'm combining two things, which is you have a vision for what the future should be and the perp, and the, the kind of, I would say the human side of it, which is the purpose behind that vision and what it means. And so I think that that actually is really important to set first and foremost as a grounding point. And then I think it is very much around, how do you, um, uh, I guess, answer the question for most people, what does it mean for me? So putting someone on Mars is, 
interesting, but in, in my work, my day-to-day work, right, and what I'm trying to do, um, what does it mean for me? And it has two parts of it, which is what does it mean to me personally, right, my job, my role. And number two is what does it mean for you on a professional level in the sense of what or, or in terms of what you need to do and that part is where um, it's really translating that vision into it's, it's essentially chunking it up right is the best way to eat an elephant is to chunk it up into pieces um, uh, and I think that that is actually what you need to be able to do and if you cannot translate from that vision to chunking it up to stuff that people can actually think about in a tangible way I think that's where people get lost and the, great, the best leaders are the ones that are able to say, in both its bottoms up and top down, I have a vision for what I want to do, but I have now also engaged all the people that are sitting there thinking about, well, how do I make it happen, right, to be able to, to bridge right, the gap between those two and break it down into pieces so that people can actually embrace it and say, okay, I get what I need to do differently tomorrow. You know, what's the work in front of my plate? But I also have a meaning behind it, which is what does it mean for me um, in my personal, right, personally, as I do these things. Yeah, this is exactly what we, we, we did one year, one year and a half ago with the People Manifest, talking about people acting on their own best interests. So, you know, what this reality related to, to, to what I'm doing and how do I think? I have one, not a question that I want to, to ask you both. You, uh, It's about lessons learned. Uh, one of the key uh, results that Eddie presented was one of the topics to learn from the past. And then I put COVID-19 in front of us now. Uh, and look, I, I, I did a, a webinar recently and I took The Economist, uh, the word in 2020. You know, that a very powerful, The Economist is an excellent uh, uh, media. And I read it and I say, there was no single line I'm saying, saying, oh, look, something could shut down the planet in, in 10 weeks. So we, we are just suffering something that we never thought it would be so severe and so fast. So what is the value of lessons learned in this current world in transformation? So I just want, because I don't have an answer, so I would wonder to hear from you uh, uh, what do you think? And you, you both can answer that. Gina, do you want me to go first or do you want to go? Absolutely, please. Oh, go ahead, Kit. Yeah, so I think the one thing I would say is there actually are a lot of people who predicted this. Um, Bill Gates is one of them. I, uh, you know, even there were investments in um, that Bloomberg made ages ago in, ton, in a backstock of ventilators. So I, I would say that the, you know, the, that we never expected this to happen. Um, most people never expected this to happen. And I would say that um, it, it is not something we've experienced in our lifetime because this is the first time we have things like global travel at the time where, you know, at the time of the bubonic plague, that wasn't a, that wasn't a challenge, right? So I would say that it, it, it's not that, it, that people thought it wasn't gonna happen, um, but I do think there is a sort of failure of imagination um, in terms of it, once it's so far away and it's not localized to understanding the impact on you, that it's very, very challenging to take action. So the analog I would use is climate change, right? Um, we, th we know what's happening and yet we really struggle to take systemic action. Um, and so we will be in, in a similar situation there, but we need to find a way to make it hyper-local so that people understand what changes to make now. Yeah, and I would, yeah, and I think that part of this is, um, so it's happened, right? But the reality is going forward, there's going to be lots of different things that will happen where we will be, I would say, precisely wrong, right? But directionally, we can actually be correct. And I think that this is where um, a lot of the learning even now is that we need to do a lot better on scenario planning. So it is not necessarily to say we predict the future, but it is to say there are a number of different scenarios in which the world can unfold. 
that you couldn't possibly imagine um, on a normal basis, but you need to, right? You need to work through because it's more around preparedness than anything else. And so, so I think that if you think about organizations and how you do transformations, um, in the past when we did transformation work, it was something where you said, okay, this happens every five, ten years. We're going to have to do something pretty dramatic in terms of a strategic shift. Well, we all know that that's not true anymore. People are actually making strategic shifts very, fairly rapidly. And and, ha- and and how do you actually build the organizational capability to do that? Well, part of it is to kind of almost scenario plan on how might the world change, maybe in the small way in terms of how you operate as an organization and how you compete to this, this you know, broad macro sense, right, that COVID-19 has forced us to face. But in all cases, it's building that organizational capability to be able to sense. So to say, okay, I have certain scenarios that we're thinking through, we think are possibilities, even some extreme cases, but I'm actually constantly paying attention and sensing because the warning signs, even Kip pointed out, the warning signs were already there for different these things to play out. Again, precisely wrong, but directionally correct, that you could have predicted. Um, um, in that sense, and you could have sensed it and then been able to react much quicker. And I think that's really the learning right now. Like, I don't really know how to think about today in the sense of, well, can I predict the future? No, but now I know how much more volatility I should be building into my scenarios going forward. Jen, uh, also on that, Eddie, uh, can you just put back the slide about the industry sectors? Because I want to take one question from the audience. Uh, Scott Ambler um, uh, did uh, the following statement. He said, uh, I suspect that there is a correlation between the level of competition within an industry and the need to transform faster. So I would ask Eddie and and Jean to step in and say, do you agree with that or not? Competition is something that is driving these companies, these industries, to transform faster or its products? What, what is your take on that? Let, let me go first, Ginny. Um, I think it's not only competition, right? Because competition per competition uh, we have for many years. I think it, it, competition is driven by change in, in any other aspects of the, or from consumer market, from a consumer perspective, from a technology perspective. If you see, for example, automotive industry, um, we are talking about electrification, the future of mobility, et cetera. So these are the change or the drivers that are making these organizations to transform faster and faster and faster. And I, I, I would risk telling them, and Jeannie can, can, can also jump in that, that it's not because they wanted to transform, it's because they are being forced to transform. Is that what's happening now? with a lot of other organizations that see themselves in a situation that they could not anticipate or be ready for. So the level of responsiveness for these organizations are very low. So that's why they're looking for agile ways of working. So this chart is representing, so before a crisis, so this is before COVID, I would say most of the, the changes here, the transformation rate is being forced by competition, of course, but also other aspects of their business model or the products or the sector they are in. You can see government and education and insurance on the other spectrum, like health insurance or health or medical services. And today is actually, I would tell you that most of the organizations uh, in these other spectrum are being forced to transform themselves in some way. Retail is one of good example. Um, so I would say that are many other aspects that are driven driving actually uh, the way organizations are transforming here. In this case, because this was this data was collected before the COVID, I would say it's, there are many aspects to technology and, and, and new opportunities like disruption, etc. Today, I would say if we invert this chart a little bit, I would say most of the organizations that are fast in transforming is because they are seeing themselves in a really risky position that they need to take action no matter what. Jeannie? Yeah, yeah, and I would actually say that there's also, I mean, I think the complexity in all of this is also um, customer demand and behavior. So, 
I think that you can't actually isolate it to a given industry, right? I think what it is is on top of that, and you can even see it in COVID with the COVID-19 crisis, is that as consumers, customers um, change how they use your products or their expectations of your services because other sectors have done better, right? Um, it actually forces, it puts pressure on you because ultimately, right, the winning formula is how do I serve uh, my customers? How do I meet their demands? And so, um, you know, maybe to put a finer point on what Eddie just said, I think right now government is actually being forced to really uh, transform itself uh, first in the near term because of how they need to serve people, um, but also in the longer term because I think that as we think about everything from how our various healthcare systems work and the government's role in in supporting the resiliency of that through to how do you even serve customers digitally, right, as opposed to um, having people come into government offices to you know, get things done, right? And I think that that's actually, you know, being proved out that right now, the digital transformation that you can actually see across all industries is spurred on by the fact that right now we're forced to only really interact in a remote and digital way. Yeah, that that's perfect. I have a, another question here from Otti. Otti, great to see you. And uh, we met uh, uh, at the World Economic Forum this year. And he, he has a very interesting question that I want to hear uh, your opinion, Kit. Uh, to what degree does the current crisis of COVID-19 COVID reinforce or delay the discussions and learnings about the purpose of stakeholder capitalism or being more human on the way we practice capitalism? So do you think this will reinforce and the need for that, or this will just delay even more? I'm an optimist, so it's hard for me not to think or to hope that this will expedite some of the conversations about ultimately what is the purpose of corporations and beyond just um, stakeholder, um, shareholder value and extend to broader stakeholders, including employees and um, the environment, for instance. And so my hope is that what this is showing us is some of the vast inequities that existed but are being laid bare. Um, for instance, we've been having many discussions both within the, my nonprofit and some of the client work around the vast inequities in what um, who has to work right now and who, you know, essential frontline workers, both hospital workers and anyone working in delivery um, and how basically there are people with the choice to protect themselves and people without. And so my hope is that by exposing some of these vast inequities, we start to think about what does it mean to even as a corporation serve your employees and the environment and but, you know, we'll see what happens. <laughs> Ginny, do you want to say something about your view about the new way we'll do capitalism in the future? I think there was already some movement, right, even before everything happened in organizations talking about purpose, right? What is the broader purpose? And I actually don't think that there's a trade-off necessarily. And I think that was the that was the needle that everyone was trying to thread, which is we can have a purpose around doing good, right, in terms of our employees and the, the environment and our communities, uh, as well as um, being able to make money, right, and, and have a thriving business. And a lot of the conversation that has been had has been around if I can actually think through and articulate what is a very clear purpose for my organization, and what we, the meaning behind what we do, right? And use that to guide our choices on what we do. Um, you actually end up having a win-win, right? Because you're, you're, you're motivating your workforce, right? They feel like they're taken care of and they're fairly treated, right? You, you are, you are um, serving your communities 
and supporting um, the communities and, and your public in a way that causes customers to actually want to buy your product, right? And so those things actually, the, the motivation of the employees to do better and be, do better work, be more productive and engaged with the company, and your customers actually finding you attractive as a, a, a company to either, you know, to purchase products and services from. I mean, that's like actually a win-win. Um, so I actually, maybe along with Kit, I'm actually being an optimist here that things will actually continue to get better. Yeah, I, I, just a follow-up question. So what you as a leader on, on BCG are telling your young employees in your office that are facing this for absolutely the very first time and some of them, I'm sure, they are afraid about their jobs, their future, you know, their careers, whatever. So what would be your message about uh, to them, if you can share with us? Well, I think a lot of it is just, um, the kids of this, we communicate. I spend a lot of time communicating and communicating isn't mean, doesn't mean one way, let me present to you and everything is good. It is, it is communicating in a very authentic way, which is to say, these are the things I know. This is what's working well. These are things that really matter or priorities for our, our you know, firm. Um, and being very transparent also that like, these are things you also, we need to be able to consider from a risk management perspective and how, you know, all the different complications and the messiness of that. And the fact that we don't know a lot of things. And I think that I, I actually find that that's actually quite, that's actually works really well. Um, and it's two way. It's a lot of, Fireside chat, people can ask me anything, and you're going to get a fairly um, just transparent and honest answer. And again, it can be messy, and that's okay. And I think that, that showing humanity as leaders is actually part of this whole process right now. Um, and, and so I think that that's helpful, and I also think it is helpful in that, um, again, a lot of the things that are happening to us specifically are very novel. But I was, I started at BCG the month after 9-11 in New York, right? So I work in financial institutions practice and, you know, was, was there in 2008. So, so you can still draw on, right, these experiences to really tell people that, look, I'm actually thinking about this in a coherent, right, objective way as opposed to purely you know, sky's falling because everything is unknown, which is not true either. Yeah, it's to be resilient. Yeah, uh, Eddie, uh, I have a, a question uh, from uh, for you from Nicholas uh, Riyad. Uh, how many of the top transformers, going back to the industries, the top transformers are uh, were exponential organizations? Uh, okay, as the file by Salim Ismail and Singularity these companies that are growing in, in a dramatic pace. So what is the, is there a correlation between this kind of exponential growth with the ability to transform? So did, did we find some evidence on that, on, on the research? Um, we, we don't have any specific relate to the, how we characterize the organizations per se. This is more a uh, cut on the industry sector classification versus what uh, what they're doing in terms of transformation practice, et cetera. But I, I, I wanna share some perspectives on, on, on that. I think most of these organizations that are transforming faster, they found ways of keeping the business or keeping the operations that they need to keep today for the bottom line, plus making sure that there will be something different in the future. So actually anticipating the future and sensing the future and adapting to the future today by adopting new ways of working, by thinking about what technology we can adopt in our organization to make things, to make things faster, simple, and, and et cetera. So I would say there are some characteristics in these organizations that we can talk or relate to exponential growth or exponential uh, organizations in, uh, to some extent, but I also must say that some of these organizations here, and of course we don't have a specific cut on, on the characteristics of the organization uh, per se, but most of the organizations, you can, if you take a look on these internet sectors, they're not necessarily technology driven. 
so they have from uh, physical products like cars, some technology and services that are more 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 um, inclined to be forced to transform, like banks and financial industry. Uh, so finance you have here, but you also have other industry that realize it. So, for example, the energy industry, they know that the way we consume energy, the way we produce energy is going to change in the future. So unless this sector that is really traditional in, in, in terms of uh, implementing new technology, new process, new operations, it, it's very capital driven. Unless they start now transforming the organization or thinking about how can we be different in the future, probably some of them will not be sustainable in, in, from a business perspective in the near term, maybe 10 years, uh, 20 years. So we can go from oil uh, production, refinement to uh, producing electro, uh, electric energy as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, on a follow-up on that, I, I want just to bridge what you just said about the sector and, and Jean said about her experience. So Sergio uh, made a, a, a very nice question to say, uh, people need purpose in their work and business needs. So what is your advice for those who are leading and working in business that are now rendered as a low value? So if you are working in something that is being rapidly disrupted, so what, what, what would be your advice on that? You want me to take this a kit? Yeah, yeah, yep. Please. Yeah, I was thinking about you, uh, Jenny, but Kit can step <laughs> in. Please. Well, I think that this becomes almost part of the part of it is actually redefining what it is that you do, right? There, there's a piece around redefining what you it is that you do. So, for example, and I'm I'm going to make a very localized example. Um, I have a team of people who do uh, a lot of events right and an affiliation and things in our office we can't get together right now so you could easily say okay uh, uh, you know i don't have a purpose anymore right i think that that's actually too e it's too easy to give up on that um what i've seen our team do is basically say okay my purpose is to really create a sense of community right i do these events I do these activities, not to do the activities. The purpose is to create community and to create togetherness of all um, the people within our firm or our office. How do I do that now? And so they've actually spent a lot of time thinking through, right, what they're doing um, in terms of online gatherings, right? Uh, you know, I'm probably the least technologically capable of, 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 um, of my team at times. And I even did an Instagram takeover to kind of foster, right, um, to show what it was like to work at home as a way to just foster the sense of, right, human connection. And I think that that's actually, a re in a very small example, a way to say, okay, how do I redefine what I do, right, to give, to, to, to understand what that purpose is? And that actually is also, at a personal level, I say, you know, if, if you're concerned about your job, you're concerned about your job security, um, it actually requires people sometimes to reimagine what it is that they do by grounding it in the purpose, right? Because I think that that, like in that situation, I have plenty, there's plenty to do for our team that's doing affiliation and, and events because there, there's, that still has to happen here, even if we're working from home. I'd love to add to that, actually, if you don't mind. Um, that really resonates with me. A lot of the work that we do at Co-Collective is centered around purpose and helping organizations define kind of a higher purpose, which we call it a quest. And one of the parameters of, of a purpose is that it has to pass muster for context change, right? So I, I think about the example that you said around events, which obviously now that the context is that we cannot gather in in person and we must find a new way to gather, the principle remains the same, which is that the purpose is building community. And I think that that actually, I would even go even farther to say that's a prerequisite of a purpose, that it isn't about the tactical application. It is it is about the, what are you achieving all up, which enables you to have more flexibility in thinking through how I could bring that to life. 
Yeah, that that's perfect. I have a question that is very related to that. That is about uh, the use of technology. Uh, Stefan Bozakar uh, asked, "What is the role of digital technology transformation, uh, and what it, does it play in the organization capability to transform faster and better?" So, for example, some of the business they can be uh, they can become digital in a far easier way than other segments. Let, let, let me give you a very simple example, like a financial sector and a hotel. So you, you cannot say, oh, virtual hotel rooms. I don't know yet. Maybe someone will come up with that. But I'm saying some the nature of your business sometimes helps you uh, to be faster on implementing digital transformation. So what, what is your opinion on that in some segments that are not very easy to, to get digital faster? Is this for me or Jeannie? Any of you, both, both, that's great. So any of you? Um, I, I would say that, you know, one of, one of the learnings that I've had around transformation and change in general, and a lot of the literature shows this, is that you really do need some kind of what's called a perturbation or some kind of big um, moment that that emphasizes the change. And I think that, listen, we've been talking a lot about adopting new technologies and, and I think a lot about the human resistance to adoption of new technologies and the challenges in getting people to change the way they're working when they've been working that way for a very long time. And then you see something like this and how overnight, um, we've been talking about you know, remote and decentralized working, all of us have, the, to your point at the beginning, around the future of work, et cetera. And then all of a sudden, oh, in the past couple of weeks, everyone has learned how to use multiple technologies, collaborative technologies, online technologies, and that, that just happened. And so sometimes it is about creating the conditions or taking the opportunity of the conditions to speed up the adoption of new technology because unless it becomes an imperative not everyone's going to get on the on the boat yeah and i, I would actually just add here which is um someone was just joking right that uh, covid19 is the cause of your digital transformation across all industries right and i think that the question becomes do you go back to the old ways when um, we ramp back to some version of a, new, a normal or a new normal? And the answer is those that are going to win in the marketplace, that are going to actually have the competitive advantage are those that realize that they could use this opportunity to accelerate that change um, because people have already seen that this works. Um, and there's a catalyst and use that as a catalyst. Um, I think that's actually the big thing here now is that as we've all learned how to do um, work remotely and use digital channels. Um, I wouldn't want anyone to lose that, like going back, quote, going back, whatever that means, right? Because this is, this is just a, a best opportunity now to kind of force the digital transforma transformation, whether it's in banking or in, um, you know, wholesale. And the question, the question is also, can you go back? Uh, one, one, um, one great example that's on the environmental side is in, in South Africa, when they had the water crisis, um, there, there were all of a sudden massive water restrictions and ways that you behaved very differently with water, right? Collecting water from the shower and reusing it to clean the house, for instance. And I was listening to um, one of the water laureates speak and she shared that the, the main takeaway from that experience was that after they had kind of gotten out of the, the crisis moment, the behaviors didn't change actually. That there was a there was a new relationship that South Africans had with water and water conservation, and so I think the question is also, can you go back once these new behavior loops are formed? Yeah, uh, this makes me remember when I was studying uh, my PhD, uh, and my professor said, uh, the water in the river, when you observe the water in the river, and the water passed it will never come back because the water will never be the same and you will never be the same after looking. So, you know, we, we really, uh, this is an absolutely golden uh, uh, answer. If someone knows how the, work, uh, the world will look like 
after that, right? Because we, we are still having so many paths uh, uh, to look for. And, and my, my question uh, to you, Jim, uh, what is your suggestion or advice for those leaders in organizations that are struggling to adapt to this new uh, reality that transformation is an imperative? So what, what would be your advice to them? Well, I think, so I, I actually want to give more credit to people because I don't actually think that there's, in, in this crisis, people have actually had to act. And I think the, 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 all the things I've heard around people creating, especially exec, right, at the executive level, creating war rooms, control towers, to really drive um, the, the almost both the essentialness of continu business continuity through to, you know, continuing to operate in a way where um, they have been quicker to make decisions, quicker to get together other executives, you know, and, and move, make progress um, out of necessity. You're already doing it. That's, I mean, I think that a lot of the learning from the study is that a lot of these behaviors that we're talking about are the stuff that we all had to take on. You know, everybody did, not just leaders. And to recognize that you did okay, right? And for the most part, right? And I think that that's the part where I think for most leaders is to reflect perhaps a bit more on during this crisis moment, what was I doing? What did I do well? What did I do, do poorly? What were some new behaviors I picked up that actually weren't that scary? Right. After all, there was a lot of sacred cows that got actually, you know, slayed in this this whole crisis that has forced people to kind of realize it wasn't so bad. And so I think that that's really what I want to tell leaders because a lot of us are successful because of our past behaviors, right? And we kind of go, okay, this thing, this only way of working works for me. That's how I got to this position. Well, we just had a reset, and you realize that you're still in position, and things actually you know, maybe in continued crisis mode, but it's still, you're, you're, you're still operating and things are still, right, functioning for you. So that's probably the bar now, right, as opposed to what made you successful in the past. Can I, can I ask, uh, can I add, uh, add a, a follow-up question on, on that, Ricardo? Absolutely. So we, we, as part of Rightline, we did a, another study last year on the, on the crisis situation. So how organizations can leverage a situation of crisis to transform themselves, to become a, a different organization. And one of the findings we, we found is that even though organizations can emulate some time or, or migrate the, the crisis mode's way of working, uh, so they can get rid of process, they can make decisions faster. Like Jimmy mentioned, you can create war rooms and get all together. So there is a tension, there is a stress level in a crisis mode that a lot of leaders that we interview think that is not sustainable in the long term. So after the crisis, we're probably going to go uh, uh, to, a, to a new norm or a new way of working. But I think a lot of people... They are thinking in the day, they say, oh, now it's everything back to normal. I don't want to be stressed anymore because I loved my life before. I don't want to leave this stress forever. How we can cope with this anxiety and stress level from this crisis mode? Of course, not losing the gains and the benefits we get from working in a different way, but also not making sure people will burn out after working this level after six months. I think Kit might be best prepared for this one. There's just so many interesting um, things that you brought up in that question. And the one I just want to start with is I've been really loving reading a lot of the writing about the experience of grief and grieving, um, the loss of the things that we had and the fact that we're entering not into a return to normal, but rather what we're calling, at least in, in my organization, a new abnormal. Um, and with any change, I think that, that sometimes we overlook the element of the, the stages of grieving. You, you never kind of leave some anything behind, whether it was something that you didn't enjoy or enjoyed without a sense of, of loss, naturally. And so I think that 
understanding that that's a part of the process as well is important in terms of what I like to call the emotional metabolism. I think individuals have emotional metabolism and so do organizations. Organizations are made up of individuals with emotional metabolism and therefore the entire organization has a certain speed at which they process information and, and adopt um, new behaviors and new kind of frames of mind. So just, just a lot of very interesting, interesting things in that. Yeah, let me add also, this is uh, also a personal uh, thought, is that sometimes on this, uh, uh, life is a set of cycles, different cycles on our life and, and, and the world's life. And, and sometimes one thing that I learned uh, from my history uh, is um, sometimes for you to move, you need to jump. And jump means you, you, you need to go for it. And you cannot say, oh, I want to go, but I don't want to go at the same time because you know they, they are mutually exclusive. Sometimes you need really to jump into something that is new to find out what is there. It, it's not possible because what we want, we want to have all doors open at all the time. And life is not like that. So I remember when I decided to move from Brazil to Denmark, do you imagine how do you feel being a Brazilian moving to Denmark? You know, but uh, there is no way to say, oh, I want to live in Brazil, but but doing them, it doesn't work. At some point, you need to say, look, I think I have enough information and I, I just have to go. Sometimes you, you have to go because it's an opportunity. Sometimes it's just because, you know, it's burning platform. So you, 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 you have no other option. So right now, for example, staying home and, and going digital, there is no other way. You, 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 if you don't go, you, you just die. So this is for me, uh, what I think. And, and this drives me, I, I have two more questions. So I want to, to, to highlight one question here that is very interesting. Uh, Prismac, uh, asked a question, uh, and this is a question for you three, uh, um, in the current situation is viable to develop a strategy for the foreseeable future or you just build an interim approach and wait things happen and adapt over time. So I want just to hear from you three, your, your opinions on that. Who wants to go first? Happy to. Okay. Oh, go ahead, Kip. Okay, okay. No, you can. Okay, well, so, so look, I, I actually disagree with that. Um, concept of you can't put together a strategy because a strategy has multiple time horizons. Um, the way that I know uh, not only do a lot of um, companies are thinking about it, but governments are also thinking about it is um, we're moving into, right, we're, we're currently in the flattened stage, right, of, of the epidemic. And in different geographies, it's going to move to a fight stage. And that's really your near term of what do I need to do to get you know things going again, and there is a there is a, uh, a set of things that need to happen right a around that. But that actually has to still be congruent with a longer term strategy of when you are moving into your future stage, which is when you get to a point where um, maybe there is a vaccine or or something. You know, it, it's in a, a perhaps more stable situation where you're not going back to the old way of working anyway so so but what's the through line right because if you're constantly changing the through line on your strategy um that a doesn't give your organization enough uh, of an opportunity to to actually uh, follow through right with your strategic initiative so there is a bit which is more around time horizon planning which is to recognize in the near term there's going to be a lot of things in the fight stage where um it's a lot of it's just tactical stuff. It's not actually strategic. It's tactical stuff, which is a set of must-haves you have to do. Um, but you need to make those decisions in light of the broader long-term strategy, right? Um, and 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 I think that that's the part that gets lost. Where, you know, I I, I I'm I am a strategist. I also am a person who's very focused on kind of the financials and the numbers. But I'm going to keep going back to culture, right? And and purpose, which is if you don't, if you're constantly shifting, you may actually do things that go against the purpose and culture of your organization. 
which in the long term hurts you in your competitive advantage. And I think that that's why I actually believe that there is always a through line, but just different time horizons. I totally agree with that. And, and I think for, for women in innovation, one of the things that we've tried to think about is immediately providing our teams with what changes and what stays the same. Um, so, you know, we had, we had an existing strategy and we have our mission, our values, our vision, and immediately reiterating to the team, those are pieces, the vision stays the same. Um, the mission stays the same, the values stay the same. The way that we actually execute those in this context um, is going to change and the team then worked to adapt some of our um, shorter term strategic initiatives to fit into that model. And I think the other side of that is um, also the opportunities it creates. So to be concrete in the women of innovation, innovation example, we, we offer in-person uh, learning and development for women in innovation. And so immediately, and that became difficult. And we also have a chapter model. So we're based in New York, London, and San Francisco. But immediately the opportunity for us was that overnight we were a global team with global reach. So we were no longer a chapter structure. And so the, the, the thing that we needed to think about was what does that mean in terms of the opportunities that it provides us to further our mission, to further our strategic initiatives, to expedite some of the ones that might've been on the back burner. And so I would say that figuring out um, to Jeannie's point, what remains the same and what is the through line and how that ultimately delivers on the purpose you've assembled around. Eddie? Yeah, I just want to compliment that we shouldn't waste this crisis to actually rethink the way we do things. So strategy is, is the why for the organizations, the, why the organization exists and how, uh, what they want uh, as an organization and, and as a group of people and how they're going to do that. So. I wouldn't waste this crisis actually to rethink uh, the way you do business, to rethink how your organization will look like in the future because there is no other better situation, unfortunately, given all the bad things that are happening globally, to actually stop and say, you know, we can do things differently. And now it's the time to start planning and actually taking an action for that. So it's very hard when you when you are in the in the on a on a on a stable mode that most organizations somehow were before the crisis and now suddenly you see yourselves in a, in a, in a situation that your organization can go bankrupt in, in a matter of a month because you don't have any business anymore. So that's the time to stop and say how we do things different, how we innovate, the way we, we deliver our purpose, the way we, we envision our company for the future. So take this time to actually rethink your organization and the way you deliver uh, value. I have, uh, I, I, this is my final question and, and, and this uh, kit is for you, okay? Um, you know, I'm managing for 38 or 39 days a transformation with three women at home, okay? So, uh, and uh, if you, uh, uh, recently I read a Washington Post article talking about women leaders in the COVID crisis, um, Germany, Finland, um, New Zealand, and they are all doing extremely well on, on the response of the COVID comparing with others. So is there any secret that you can share with us on their behavior, their attitude that is driving such a, a huge success? on this transformation. Can you share your thoughts on that? Yeah, one of my favorite topics. Um, I loved that post article and there was also an article in The Atlantic yesterday about Jacinda Arden um, and her leadership. And, you know, I think some of the things that we've been talking about of, of qualities of leader leaders are, are absolutely true in this context. So empathetic leadership, right? Really leading with humanity and with authenticity. Um, I think Jacinda has done that really beautifully. Um, I think communication, we talked about that. Um, some examples of her doing Facebook live streams and she's wearing her sweatshirt and her family's in the background. 
it's, it is just truly authentic and shows that she is part of the community. And so the community is really trusting her. And I think the third piece is it being extremely decisive. So obviously collecting insights, information, and input, but being extremely decisive and clear um, and quickly. They made some of the quickest, in New Zealand, they made some of the quickest decisions about what they were shutting down, when they were shutting it down, and for how long. And then the last thing I would say, which is which really stood out to me when I read the, the Atlantic article, was the, the choice in language and modeling that Jacinda has, has chosen. Um, she's using the word, for instance, um, bubble to talk about who can kind of be in your in your sphere. It's a very human word. It's a very natural. It's not a it's not a super political word. Um, and then she's modeling it by being on a Facebook live stream and saying, oh, oh, here's, you know, Leroy, he's a part of my work bubble. And so she's she's demonstrating and modeling the behavior that she wants the community to enact. And I just think that those are the qualities of the really extraordinary leader. And um, and that we can all learn from, whether it's man or woman. Um, so really impressed by her her behavior and the results, right? 12 deaths in New Zealand. That's extraordinary. That's, that is, is really unbelievable. So look, uh, we, we it's time for us to, to close. So first, I want to thank you, Kit. Uh, thank you, Jim. Eddie, thank you. And Eddie, I need a double thank you because he was led the research. So thank you from, from my heart. Thanks to the whole team that is in the back, you know, Emil, Tairu, Yavnika, Janine, Ching Ching, so all of you, Sergio, the, you did a great job. And my final message is that you can download this report at brightline.org. And we will be releasing as part of the Project Management Institute. Uh, something quite interesting coming up in, in May. I cannot disclose the full details, but something that will help those on the project management field to understand more about transformation. So this, just stay on it. This will, will happen very soon, and it will help uh, the, your team uh, to get through, through that. So thank you very much. My final message to all of you is uh, stay safe, okay? Let's, I hope you, find, you found this useful and you can count on us. Thank you very much for joining us and see you until next time, okay? Take care.